I want you to turn to Matthew chapter 2. We're looking at the wise men scene again. And I'm uh, particularly interested in uh, one significant uh, verse, which is verse 11. Uh, Matthew, as you uh, know, is the only uh, place in the scriptures where we have anything about the wise men. Luke gives the whole shepherd thing, and they're local, and uh, angels appear in the sky, and you've got that whole scene taking place. Uh, but this is several years later, maybe two years later, uh, after the birth of Jesus. They come, it's in a house where they find him. It's probably a toddler by this time. Uh, calculations from the passage itself tells us that Herod is making a plot, and he finds from the wise men in verse 7 exactly when the star appeared first, which we would say was the birth of Christ. And then later in verse 16, it tells you how he killed all the baby boys from that time period under in order to cover uh, the span of time that Jesus probably would be in age. So it was two years. So uh, they have wandered around, these wise men, for some two years looking for the Christ child. have had very little direction. Star appears, gets, they get the message, then they get on camels, ride around for two years, uh, wondering where he is. Uh, probably lots of disappointment. Uh, where is he? Uh, the star is not leading them. Finally, uh, through the tradition, no doubt, <coughs> of the prophets and Daniel, uh, in the exile time, uh, they discovered it was a Jewish-born king. And so they came to Jerusalem expecting everybody in Jerusalem to understand and know exactly where this Christ would be. And so they're running up and down the streets in verse 2, grabbing everybody they see, saying, where is your newborn king? Uh, again, expecting that they would know. But everybody got upset. According to verse 3, Herod the king was, heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. So everybody was upset. It's amazing how Christmas can just write down upset you. <laughs> Private joke, sorry. Uh, so uh, finally Herod went down and uh, got the uh, church folks in on it and uh, talked to the pastor and the scribes and uh, the Sunday school teachers and got into the scriptures and found out he was born in Bethlehem. And then they quote this uh, prophecy, which is Micah chapter 5, verse 2, which is given to you in Matthew chapter 2, verse 6, that it's in Bethlehem, the land of Judah, that he will be born. Five miles down the road. Amazing to me. And then in verse 7, you got the Herod uh, gets the wise men secretly and begins to interrogate them to nail down exactly when the Christ was born and the star appeared. And, of course, he sent them off in verse 8 to Bethlehem saying, hey, you go find him, come back. I really want to worship him. You liar, you. Well, I've heard that from a lot of people. I really want to worship him. My, my, my. And yet we crucify him. So the wise men uh, got up the next morning, headed out for Bethlehem, and the star appeared. Whoa, we're on the right track. We're on the right track. And they rejoiced with exceedingly great joy. And the star actually took them and whoo, right to the very house. And they went in. And you have this phenomenal verse. Listen to this thing. Verse 11. And when they had come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary his mother. And they fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented gifts to him. Gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Reading it again. And when they had come into the house... They saw the young child with Mary, his mother. They fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented gifts to him, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. One of the things that showed up this last week uh, that I wrestled with probably most of my life is perception. The idea of perception. I don't know how to handle it. I don't know what to do with it in relationship to us, you and me. I don't know how to handle it in relationship with the church. Um, frankly, I don't even know how to handle it in relationship to myself and God. Everybody has a perception. You've heard the old statement, uh, oh, a little different words maybe, but uh, hey, there's what you perceive, there's what I perceive, and then there's the truth. Because <laughs> we all have our perception. Uh, you look at me and you see a certain thing, you see a certain uh, idea, you have a certain idea, 
you have certain reactions, you have certain, what if it isn't that way? What if I look at you and say, oh, they're snobbish, but what if it isn't really that way? What if it's my perception at the moment and it doesn't have anything to do with What if you walk by me and you just ignore me on Sunday morning and you don't even shake my hand and I think, good night, they don't like me. And what if it's just you had a bad night and you, had up, you were up half the night and you were, had something else on your mind and but I perceived. See, perception really matters. How you perceive things. and Again, what is the right perception? And how do you nail all that down? And how do you keep all that correct within a body who wants to operate within relationship? And I have a perception of what you meant and you didn't mean that at all. And <laughs> I thought you did and you didn't. And wow, and how can I? And I, uh, Perception. It's really difficult, isn't it? Isn't that difficult? How do you figure that out? It's really difficult when you come to, when, when you come to God. Because God has a perspective. I have a perspective. What if my perspective is not like his? What if there is a divine logic that doesn't make a bit of sense to me? <laughs> what if he doesn't think like I think? See, I take my perception, my perspective, and I impose it on him. Because I'm, man, come on. I'm educated and I'm smart. Listen, I got a doctor in front of my name. So God probably thinks like I do. Well, how do I think? Well, I just get impatient. I mean, things happen, and I just get ticked off. And I tell you, I've had it. And when, I, when I've had it, I, I kind of explode, and I just double up my fist and sock it in the wall. Probably God's like that. I bet he is. I bet he eventually gets impatient. Probably he's long-suffering more than I am, but probably there comes a point when God says, I have had it. I, hey, I'm done. Hey, you've gone too far. I've told you too many times, and I'm telling you that's it, and hey, you're done. Only God doesn't smash walls. He takes his big finger and flips you into the abyss. I took care of that. He won't bother me anymore. But what if God's not like that? What if God never gets impatient? And I know you're going to say, oh, I can show you scriptures in the Bible in the Old Testament where... What if God isn't like that? What if that's the way you perceive it? And your, perce your perception and the way you see it and the way you think. One of the areas where this really gets tough is that we perceive things. For instance, if you've got a job, here's a job. You, it's a plumbing job. What do you want? You want a good plumber. See, you're not going to call on me, <laughs> although I'd be cheap. But, hey, it's not. I don't. See, you want somebody who's skilled in plumbing. Uh, what, if, what if you got car problems? Who do you want? You want a mechanic, somebody who's skilled in mechanic. In other words, if you've got a job, you want to match the job with the strength and the talent of the individual. So around the church, what do we do? Oh, we need a teacher for the children's class. Oh, good. Who are we going to get? Somebody who's skilled and trained in teaching, oh, teaching children. Somebody who knows how to put pictures on the wall. Somebody who knows how to decorate the classroom. Somebody who knows how to hit kids and dot bruise them. We need that kind of a person. <laughs> Somebody who's got skill and talent in certain in that area. So that's their strength. In fact, there's a book uh, some uh, pastor gave me and wants me to uh, read. And, and you go on computer and you take this test. And it's uh, living out of your strengths. So what we're supposed to do in the church is find out what everybody's strength is. What's your talent? Oh, you're talented at that. Oh, you're talented at that. Okay, you do that. You do this. And we let people blossom in their strength area. So we've got to find out what our strengths are. What is your strength? What is your talent? What is your... What if God doesn't think like that? What if your strengths are a trap? And when you're... What you think you're strong in is really what you're weak in. Because when you think you're strong, you begin to operate out of yourself, and that traps you and destroys you. So your strength isn't your strength at all. It's your weakness. And what God wants you to do is operate out of your weakness, and he wants you to do everything you can't do. So all who have, have never had an experience working in the nursery are now going to go to the nursery, please. Not an amen in the house. <laughs> And around the church,
church, you can't say, well, I can't. Why? Because if you can't, you're the one we want. <laughs> now, come on, be honest on this. If you were going to pick out, if you were coming to the world, born, go through all this hassle, you know, Christmas deal, and you're born and, you got, and you're going through all this hassle to redeem the whole world, and you're going to set up a church, whoa, and it's going to be a kingdom, man, it's going to be great, and you're going to build this kingdom, but you're just starting really small because you don't have anybody in this kingdom yet, and you're going to select 12 guys, who would you get? Well, good night, you'd go after the talent that we need a quartet in this group for sure. And we'd have to have, and you'd have to, and you'd want, you'd want some, you'd go to, you'd get, go to Jerusalem and get the big boys. You'd get some guys who had educated, would need some money people. Some guys who were really sharp and, and, and wouldn't you? You'd get the, you wouldn't go to Galilee. Comic books? That's what they read. What's the country and western music? I mean, that's all they know. <laughs> Never been to school? They say ain't. <laughs> I mean, you wouldn't get them. See, there isn't one of the disciples you'd pick out. It's just really significant, folks, that Jesus didn't pick anybody out from Jerusalem, the schools where the big boys live, with the educations, the right to fat books. He never picked any of those boys out. But when he wanted to win a world and he picked somebody out, he went, it's the old statement, God doesn't call the qualified. He qualifies the call. But that's a divine logic. See, it doesn't make any sense to us because nobody would operate their business that way. We don't even want to operate the church that way. But that's the way God thinks. See, this gives me hope. Because maybe he would choose me. <laughs> Doesn't that give you goosebumps? That God might pick you out. But you say, I'm not. Oh, you're the one he wants. But I can't. Oh, he wants you. But my background is, yeah, I know, so he wants you. Why? Because you're the one. That's the kind of guy that God picked out. It doesn't make any sense. I know. It's divine logic. Really an internet. If you were going to be born as a king, I mean, logically, what would, what would you do? You would be born in a palace, would you not? With a king and a queen hanging around. Stable. Dusty hay. Whew. Smell of manure. See, that doesn't make any sense. If you were going to announce your birth, hey, you've been planning on this. You've, you've built a church. I'm telling you, 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 from Abraham all the way through, you've been building this nation. And prophets have been screaming this thing. And all of this has been put in place. And all of this is unfolding. And wow, you'd come to the climax. And Jesus is going to be born. And who would announce it? Well, it would be the church. It would be... It would be the scribes, it would be the chief priest, it would be the, the, the boys, the preacher boys, it would be the man, they would trumpet from the, from the pinnacle of the temple, they would, this would, this would be a, that's where the announcement would come from. And you know how he announces the birth of Christ? A bunch of pagans. Wise men from the east. Now come on. We have 613 oral traditions. That's the rules of the church. They break them all. In fact, they don't even know they break them. <laughs> we'll tell them. But they don't even know they break them. And they're going to do the announcement? Those boys from the east are going to stomp down here into our church and tell us what's right and wrong? <laughs> See, those boys, those pagans... From the east, they're going to stomp in here and tell us what the Bible says. <laughs> See, that didn't make any sense. See, they've never offered a sacrifice. They have never even repented of their sins. <laughs> they haven't been baptized. But they've never taken communion. And yet they're the stars.
you really look mad. <laughs> that gives you hope, doesn't it? Maybe he could use me. Because I'm kind of offbeat. About half know what's going on. Maybe I could get in. Don't you wonder what their secret was? Why would God use these guys? Now, it's in the passage. I love this. And it's in the grammar. Oh, that excited you. It's in the grammar. It's just beautiful, the way he writes this. It's, it's really special. There are three main verbs. There's lots of verbs in verse 11, but there's three main verbs. And they form three sentences. And the main verbs are saw, worshipped, and presented. So those are the three things they did. They saw, they worshipped, and they presented. But Matthew isn't satisfied with that. And this is what's so beautiful about his writings and what I want to talk to you about. Matthew says, hey, the seeing thing, it's good. The worshiping thing, that's really great. And the presenting thing, you need to do that. So those three things are really important. But what's more important than that is the attitude behind all three of these things. Because you don't just come and, oh, I see. You don't just come and, oh, I worship. You don't just come and, oh, I presented. No, see, there's an attitude that flows in this whole thing. And this attitude literally breaks or makes the whole idea. In other words, in the worship thing, well, I worshiped. Well, no, you didn't. Yes, I did. No, well, I was there. Well, <laughs> you can be there and not worship. Come on. So worship is an attitude. So you could sit through an entire service for an entire year they probably all seem that long. But an entire year and never, ever, ever really worship. Because it's not about, it's not about, it's not, it's, 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 it's about this attitude thing. See, well, well, I was there and I saw, no, you didn't. Well, hey, I was one of, I was one of the shepherds and I looked at him. No, that's, that's not the point, see. You can see without seeing, you can hear without hearing because there's this attitude thing. See, it's your, it's your attitude Your biggest battle, my biggest battle, is my attitude. The reason I know that is because my wife tells me. <laughs> so I want to analyze that with you. Look at the first one, verse 11. When they had come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary, his mother. Now, we're talking about responding here. The attitude is one of responding. Now, the word is saw, and last Sunday we talked about this. There's four times the word saw shows up in this story, and we, we, we hammered that last week, so we're not going to do that again, except to say that the word saw there is a translation of a Greek word which has two word groups meshed together. And the two word groups are, number one, see, physically see. So the impact of the word is they saw. Yes, they marched into this house and they say, oh, there he is right there. And they laid their eyes on him. They physically saw the Christ child. No question about that. That is there. But it's not just that. See, another word group that's meshed with this is physically seeing and comprehending, grasping, understanding, getting a hold of. Ah, oh, lights went on. Whoa, elevator went to the top. Wow, there's a toy in my Happy Meal. That's the deal. See, that's the deal. So when you put those two together, it's, oh, perceiving. Revelation comes. I see it. I see it. I see it. So they marched into this house. They looked at the Christ child, and it all came together for them. Everything they've been dreaming about for the last, for the last year. Ever since they saw the star, man, it's all come together. This whole thing is just... It's the whole thing is just unfolded, and it's all, wow, this is, and they saw, perceived, grasp, got a hold of, that's the word. But they didn't just do that. In other words, it didn't just happen. It, just, just, it wasn't just, it's the attitude. He says, let me describe the attitude for you, and he gives us oh, a participle. which is a verb that in this case 
acts like an adjective, modifying the subject which is they. So he says, let me tell you about they. Well, I know who they are. It's the wise men. The wise men stomped in. They saw. I got that. No, I want to give you a characteristic of the wise men. Why they saw. What the attitude. What, what kind of people they are. What was going on inside of them that enabled them to see. And here's the participle. When they had come. So he describes the wise men as the coming ones so who got to see the ones who came duh if you don't come you don't see now it isn't just coming well i went to church we're not talking that we're not even that's not even in the thought process the coming idea is a responding idea in other words it wasn't just this scene where they came they had been coming all the way along it was a consistent response to every message, every appearance, every pull of God on their lives. See, it was, a, it was a revelation in the star. Yes, they saw the star and got the message. Well, the star appeared to hundreds of people. I mean, absolute hundreds of people must have seen that star. They didn't come. I know. Why? It's this attitude thing. See, they saw the star. Ah, but they had been studying the traditions of their land, and they went clear back 600 years before where Daniel had planted a seed about the coming Messiah and the star and all that was going to take place, and that was implanted into their mind. And when they saw it, they responded responded in the study they responded in the star the star showed up they responded they got on camels they didn't have to they could have stayed for the little league game they could have gone to the football game they could have gone for the party that night but they didn't they did what they responded man they got on their camels man they rode for two years do you know how discouraging that must have been place after place we go to it's not the king we don't find him man this is costing us a lot wow this is hard left my family for two what's the deal man they can Kept responding, kept responding, kept responding. Could finally figure it out. It's Jerusalem, man. They come to Jerusalem, and they run up and down the streets. Where is he? And the king finds out it's Bethlehem. They respond. Get up in the morning. We're going to Bethlehem, man. We're not quitting. We're responding. The star showed up, led them. They responded. Now they're in the house, seeing why they responded. By the way, we've started a new uh, we've started a uh, class for the kids uh, on Sunday morning at nine. We have the Hebrews class for the adults. We started a kids class two Sundays ago. Keep forgetting to announce it. I had your kids in this class. I taught them this lesson because they're not in here. It's fun to talk to them. What are you going to be fifty years from now? Old. That's true. I said, what are you going to do when you're 50? Sit and sleep a lot. Wow. I tried to explain to them, what you're going to be 50 determines about how you respond now. Now, what you are 50 determines how you respond now. God speaks to you now. Nope, not going to listen. What's going to you, gonna do to you 50 years from now? See, I don't need to tell you that because you can look at your 50 and say, whoa, how did I get here? Depends on what camel you rode. And some of us have been on some awful camels. But I'm telling you, it's not too late. Because there's another star. And folks, we could respond. We could. And you never get to see unless you respond. And the whole key to this thing is every step of the way, they just responded. Now, I know, I'd like to be a great saint overnight. I've always wanted that. But I had an old lady who came to me and said, Manly, 
you want to be, uh, you want to be something overnight, and you, hey, that's the way weeds grow. See, oak trees are different. See, this was not, oh, we popped into the house. Wow, there he was. Well, take that. Goodbye. See you. And away they went. This was day after day after day, year after year. This is, whoa, how long? How long did it, t- the two-year period? How, how many days? Well, how often? The tri- what did it cost them? See, this was response time after time. Would you, would you just get into the mode of just responding to Jesus? Just, man, anything you say, Jesus, I'm in. The contrast to that is Herod. Hey, Jesus is born 55 miles down the road in Bethlehem. He knows he's there. He won't even go. Where did, where did they get the information that Jesus was born in Bethlehem? Right out of the scriptures. And the boys who know the scriptures have been looking for him every single day of their life. Every day they get up and say, could this be the day the Messiah will come? We're looking for him. Yeah, you are. Hey, five miles down the road. They didn't even go. Come on, folks, respond. Just, just respond to Jesus. Just. Well, I don't know. Don't worry about it. You will know. Walk in all the light you got. Just to respond to what you know. Because when you respond to what you know, he gives you more. And if you'll just respond... Nobody's expecting great feats out of you. Nobody expects you to wall. Nobody expects you to get up and preach next Sunday. No. Nobody expects that. If, just, just respond. If you just respond. I want to encourage you. This is not a bawling out. This is just respond to Jesus. And I guarantee you, 50 years from now, you will be someplace 50 years. You'll see, and you'll know. They saw. Oh, look at the next one. The second one is the worship thing. It's really interesting. Verse 11. When they had come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary's mother and fell down and worshipped him. Now the main verb is worshipped. Worshipped is a beautiful word. The Greek word is, well, It tells you of the culture. And the culture was really interesting because the way you greeted people, you didn't shake hands. The way you greeted people in that day, you didn't do the... uh, The way you greeted people, you didn't say hi. The way you greeted people in that day was if you were equal in status, you'd kiss them on their lips. Thank God I don't live then. (laughs) So you kissed them on their lips. Well, you're equals. If you are slightly less in status than them, in rank, you would kiss each other on the cheek. But if you were not even close in rank, what you did is you, before you got to them, you would begin to throw kisses And by the time you got to them, you would be on your face throwing kisses. This is the same identical word, and you've heard this, but this is the same identical Greek word that is used for a dog licking his master's hand. And I thought about bringing my little guy and just letting him perform for you, but (laughs) you'd get all wrapped up in him instead of me, and I'd be jealous. But anyhow, when I walk in, he's, he's going around in circles. Like I'm important. So I go home a lot. Because I feel so important. And he goes around in circles. And then I'll pick him up. And he'll just lick my face. And if I go into the room, he's in the room. Wherever I go, he is. And, and he just, he wants to be on my lap. And he just licks my hand for hours. Because probably I'm sweet. I don't know. That's this picture. It's a picture of you're so valuable. It's a picture of nothing else matters to me. 
It's a picture of my whole heart is focused right here. That's the worship thing. Now note the word, the attitude that flows through that. Again, it's a participle, which is a verb that acts like an adjective in this case. And you'll note that the, it is fell down. So it's the falling down ones that worshiped. <laughs> That's so neat. Now I know some of your souls you can't get down, and I understand that. But it's attitude. It's this attitude of I'm, I'm, I'm falling at your feet. See, I'm not, I'm not on your rank. I'm not of your status. That you are so absolutely valuable to me. That you go beyond everything in my life. Well, what are you after, preacher? Uh, are you after that I quit everything but religion? No. <laughs> don't quit your job. I don't want to have to work, so you keep at it, will you please? <laughs> so this is not about quitting anything. Don't stop anything. Keep doing everything you're doing, please. But would you please just have Jesus so valuable in your life that he's right in the middle of everything you're doing. And that he is the controlling factor of the entire thought process of what you're doing. Would you please just let Jesus get right in the middle of all your activities, of all of your thought process, of all of your finances, of all of your recreation, of, of all of your study, of all of your school, of all of, the, all of your reactions, of all of the, all of the, all of the, all of the. Would you let Jesus just get right in the... Would he be so valuable that he is the deciding factor of the entirety of your... And could you possibly say I'm Christian and not have that? Would that not be the bare bones? The falling at his feet. Let me lick your hand, dear God. Kind of deal. Because he really matters to me. See, some place I had to move from, well, I don't want to go to hell. Well, I want a mansion in the sky. Well, he'll, he'll solve this problem. Well, I want a good home. Well, I want, well, I want, well, I want, what I want to. Hey, I don't want anything. You just have extreme value to me. And if I never get a Christmas gift, by the way, you've only got about three or four days. <laughs> if I never get a Christmas gift, if, if I never get another blessing, if, if, it doesn't matter if everything in my life goes wrong from this point on. Psst, I'm still at his feet. Because somehow, he really matters. That's this. That's this. Let me give you the last one. Uh, it's the word presented. Verse 11 again. And when they had come into the house, they saw the young child with his mother, with Mary his mother. They fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented gifts to him. Gold, frankincense, and myrrh. So the three main verbs are saw, but you don't get to see unless you come. It's the coming ones who saw. They worshipped, but you never worship unless you fall down. It's the falling down ones that worshipped. The third one is presented. Presented gifts. Presented is really neat because contained within that is the idea that Jesus didn't come to them. Now, we make a, lot of, we make a big deal out of that, that Jesus comes to you. 
And it is so true. Pervenient grace. Jesus comes to you. He came to you first. See, you can't say I love him. You have to say I love you too. <laughs> you can't say I love him. I love you to him. You can't say that. Why? Because he's always said it first. So he's always come to you first. So Jesus has always come. And you could make some... You could make some argument for that even in this text. I mean, God came to them in the star. I got that. And they, God revealed. I, I get that. But if you come to the Christ in this story, see, the whole idea presented is that they came to him. So this was a distinct, direct, action, response, seeking openness of their heart that brought them to this place where they actually entered into this particular experience. They came to him. And who is it that came to him? Well, here's the, here's the, uh, the participle. Opened their treasures. Opened. So it's the opening ones who get to present. I want this for you. See, all my life in relationship to Jesus, I wanted to benefit him, to, uh, to give something to him. What could I, how could I, what would he, how do you get something for somebody who's got everything? <laughs> See, it's really difficult. And the key to the whole passage is that they were open and presented. They opened their treasures. Now, treasures has something to do with this. Because treasures is the stored up idea. In other words, it isn't just they gave him gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Oh, yeah, I got some here. It isn't that. This is what we've set aside for ourselves. See, these are our treasures. These are stored up stuff. This is, we've put this back. This is the $100 bill you got hid in your wallet. See, this is the put it back for this is what I, this is for me, see, this is, hey, I'm not, this is, I know there's the general budget, but hey, this I've just set aside, I just, this is just for me. That's what he wants. That's what he wants. Now you've got to work that through your life. In every aspect. Well, it's my life. Why don't you open it and give it? Well, well, it's my time. Why don't you open it? I've set this aside for, why don't you open it? Well, I've only got so much energy. Why don't you open it? Well, I've reserved this for, why don't you open it? Well, I've set this night aside for, why don't you open it? See, what is it that you have a right to tuck away for just? What is it that you have a right to say, well, I earned it. See, when, when can I finally say, I've given enough. See, this, this is the attitude of I'm taking everything I've set aside for myself and I'm... Oh. And folks, they're the ones who get to give the gift that's going to make the fulfillment 
bring about the fulfillment of the divine plan. You realize the gold, frankincense, and myrrh paid for the trip to Egypt and paid for their motel while they were there. While they were in exile and his life was being saved. They got in on it. Wouldn't it be interesting if God has this phenomenal plan which is so huge for this community, for this church, for these people, for this, for this, for this, whatever. Wouldn't it be interesting if God had this phenomenal plan? Whoa. And he's counting on your openness. It's going to fulfill the plan. And that's what he wants you to give. And it's all in the attitude of. See, it's the coming ones who get to see. It's the responding ones who get in on it. It's the people who are, yes, who get on the camel and ride it and see the star and okay and, and, and oh, Bethlehem and yeah, I'm gone, man. And, and they're the ones that get to walk in the house and say, oh, it's the Christ. It's the Christ. And it's the ones who fall on their face, man, and say, oh, you are so extreme value to me. Mercy. You're just, whoa, you're top priority. This is a burn of my heart. This is, whoa, everything comes under the domination of your influence. And I fall at his feet and I throw him kisses. I lick his hand like a dog licks his master. I submit like a dog submits to his master. And in that kind of relationship, wow, I get to actually worship him. And it's in that worship that I get to open up my and fulfill his dream for my world. This is a big deal. Really a big deal. Jesus can't do anything about yesterday. Can't do anything about, hey, stars that appeared in the past. I can't, hey... I'm sorry. I'm just, I'm just sorry. I've ridden a lot of camels in the wrong direction. I, I got it. I got it. But are you speaking to me this morning? And can I respond in this hour? And can I come falling on my face, submitting, worshiping, and taking all that I've set aside to have one chance to get in on the phenomenal plan of your dream for my world? And Lord, I've been here lots of times at this very point in my life. Hey, you've spoken to me. Stars have appeared before. But in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, would you do something so deep in my heart? Would you, would you show yourself so, so plainly in this hour? Would you draw me in a unique way today? Heads are bowed. He's not mad at you. He hasn't put his fist in the wall. He's not even impatient. He's not hurt. He's not pouting in a corner. 
is loving, He's desiring. If you want to know who's hurting, it's you. It's not Him. See, He let me get on a camel and go the wrong direction. That didn't hurt Him, that hurt me. And I suppose you can say he's hurting in the sense that he doesn't want that for me and it breaks his heart. I got that. But he's not mad. And he's speaking to you again. Could we respond wherever you are in the journey? Come on, wherever you are in the journey. Maybe this is your first star. I don't know. Will you get on a camel? Maybe you're in Jerusalem. Will you go to Bethlehem? Maybe the stars appeared another time. Would you follow it to the house? See, I don't know what you need to do. I don't need to know how you need to respond. Maybe you've never really been on your face. Maybe you've never really worshipped. You felt emotional stuff from the hymns and the songs, but maybe you've never really worshipped. Maybe you've never really taken what you set aside for yourself and given it to him. So our altar's open. It's a moment of response. My, what an opportunity. We're not against you. We're for you. This is not a put down. This is, oh, come on, people. You know the opportunity we've got. Christ has been born. A star has appeared. We get to see, worship, and present. Be obedient. 